got some great stuff coming up. We've got Norman Perrin, who's here tonight, actually next Sunday, doing a live set. Hello, Norman. Hello. Yeah, you get, you get a little get a little taster of him tonight. Um, we've got uh, uh, Paul Jackson, who's down in my bottom. Is is one in? Uh, is the second one along on the on the bottom row with me? You know, he's you know this is like seeing in a theatre when you're looking up at the boxes in the gallery. And uh, so Paul's Paul, who's uh, who, who's chair of the Society for Storytelling, phenomenal organisation, which has given me a certain amount of support over the years. Bless its heart. And uh, there's a. Uh, and does so much for storytelling. He's down in the, uh, he's, 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 he's on tomorrow night live. Tune in and see Paul. I'm very excited. Thank you, Paul, for coming in. Pleasure. And, uh, so th there he goes. Yeah, we've, he's just been featured up. I'm going to get, I'm, I'm going to show, take you down a bit in size. I'm going up my gallery. You're enormous. Like a giant. Yeah, you're enormous. You're enormous. And uh, so, uh, and, uh, We've, we've got lots of great stuff coming up, but tonight, tonight, I think I've rambled on enough um, for people to be able to join us. I see, actually, we've gone up by by three people while I've been while I've been uh, rambling on, and uh, so there's um, so I, I'm really I'm, these Monday night things, which we, if you haven't joined us before, we deal with a theme every Monday. Um, last week's was great. We had uh, we looked at uh, sort of rejected and abandoned daughters through Cinderella and I Love You More Than Salt stories. Uh, and uh, there's um, I mean for a a Love You More Than Salt story that we didn't have last week, but I noticed came up today on Linda Williamson's uh, uh, site, who was uh, who uh, who's um, uh, Duncan's widow. Um, she put up one of Duncan Williamson's site just to read on. It was on Facebook. Uh, Linda Williamson on Facebook. She, she yeah, put, the, the this beautiful story of I love you more than salt went up today. Um, but to, tonight's moving on to tonight's theme, which is how we deal with history through story. Oh. Um, I think this is going to be a two-nighter because I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at you know uh, uh, current affairs and things and how we deal with them. Um, you know, th there's a whole thing in the storytelling community where you know, uh, or through people, whether we tell the story of that from the hunter's point of view or the hunted point of view, and uh, the victor and the defeated and all that sort of thing. And I might, I might look at the hunted and the defeated point of view in, on another session. But right now, we're doing a much more broad brushstroke with a, did you, did you like that? Was that, sort of, that, uh, that reminded me of a certain other person. Broad brushstroke. <laughs> uh, 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 so we're gonna start with, uh, with the king of medieval Tudor bio tapestry and all that sort of thing <laughs> who, who whose books and in fact we'll be having n next Tuesday is on on live with his book launch of medieval tales through the uh, through through the uh, the history press um, it needs no introduction to half this room but if anyone who hasn't seen him before they're in for a treat uh, I don't know what he's going to talk about and which tale he's going to tell, but could you please put your hands together and give an enormous world storytelling cafe welcome to Dave Tong! Yay! Good day! <laughs> ah, hello, everybody. You can all hear me all right. Give me a thumbs up if you can all hear me. That, that's brilliant. All right. Well, interesting. I'm, I'm often described as an historical storyteller and people wonder what that means. They assume that you... You tell stories about history, so certain events, and I have done that. But it's actually more about the people in history. And one of the things that, that draws me really to stories is, is they give us insight into the, and forgive me for saying this, John, you know what I mean, the common sort, the likes of you and me. Because <laughs> often history leaves those people behind. They didn't tend to write diaries long ago most of them didn't have that great literacy they didn't leave a lot of material culture most of what you see in museums tends to be the high elite stuff but I realized when I was before I got into storytelling I, I realized if you looked at court records you could learn about a common sort the likes of you and me 
but that doesn't really do them any favours. You're only seeing them at their, how can I put it, at a low ebb. But I then realised when I got into stories that stories are an historical document as well because they reflect something of the ideas and beliefs of people long ago. And the reason I can say that is I'm talking to lots of storytellers and audience here. We all pick stories to tell that we like, that reflect some of our own ideas and beliefs that appeal to us. And people long ago were no different. And we actually know what they were taught telling, certainly by Tudor times, because the stuff is being printed for the first time in what they call chat books, broadside ballads, the cheap print of the time. And it reflects those ideas and beliefs. So what I'm going to do is tell you a story that that kind of deals with one aspect of that. And I'll, before I tell it, I'll say this. It, it's, it's a story that can... Um, garner a bit of ooh sometimes but I'm going to explain why I'm telling it to you afterwards so bear with me but let me just say this many of the stories they deal with the issues of the time so in Tudor times it was religion for one thing so lots of stories against religion lots of stories against young people then as now they thought young people were lazy and idle and didn't do enough uh, lots of stories about the the, the, the disputes between rich and poor, as you might imagine. It's no wonder that Robin Hood was very popular in Tudor times. But also there was that age old thing between men and women, husband and wife. So uh, just bear with me. Now, this story's traveled many lands, but I set it in Norwich. I would, because long ago, Norwich was an important place. If you've never been to Norwich, you should come. It's lovely. They might not let you out again. And long ago in Norwich, there lived a merchant. He was a man who made his coin by buying and selling wool. The nation of England, it grew rich on wool. Norfolk was the back of that wealth, if you like. That's where much of the wool was farmed. And so this merchant was a very rich man. He had great piles of gold in his halls. But he was no miser. He loved to spend his coin. He wore fair and fine clothes. He lived in a fair and fine house with many fair and fine tapestries upon the wall. He had himself some fair and fine, some most trusted servants. And so too, he had attracted himself a fair and fine wife, a beautiful young woman whose name was Elizabeth. Some people said she was the most beautiful woman in the whole of Norwich. Others said no. They said, no, she is the most beautiful woman in the whole of Norfolk, and you can't get much more beautiful than that. But the merchant knew better. He said, I have traveled to the strange and wondrous land of Zoom, where the women are very beautiful indeed. But even their great beauty cannot match that of my young wife. For her hair was the color of the brightest summer sun upon the brightest summer day. Her skin was as white as milk and as soft as duck down. And her lips, oh, her lips, her lips were redder than the reddest ruby ever plucked from the earth or the reddest rose ever plucked from the bush. And she, she smelt just as sweet. But there was a problem with the merchant's wife and the problem was this. She was mute. Never once had she spoken. Now, this bothered the merchant so because he thought to himself, well, if my beautiful young wife could speak, wouldn't her voice be beautiful? He felt certain if she could talk, her voice, it would match the birds singing in the trees or the angels singing to the glory of God in heaven above. That was why he was sad that she could not talk. But know this, my friends, he was not sad all the time. For he was also known or what was known as a haunter of alehouses in, in Tudor times, someone who loved a quart of ale. Every night you would find him down the alehouse with his friends, making merry. But this night, he arrived at the alehouse early. There was no one else there, save only the landlord of the pub and a strange stranger, a very strange stranger indeed. For when the merchant thought about it later, he could remember no detail of the man, save only that he wore a dark clud. Clud? Cloak. That'll do, wouldn't it? And a dark hood. You see where I went wrong there, didn't you? And a dark hood which covered his face. 
And so they sat, the merchant, one side of the table, the stranger, the other. And now they looked at each other. And the strange stranger noticed a sad look just in the corner of the merchant's eye. And he asked him what ailed him, what brought him low. And the merchant said, I have a most beautiful young wife called Elizabeth. Some say she is the most beautiful young woman in the whole of Norwich. Others say the whole of Norfolk. But I have travelled to the wonderful land of Zoom where the women are very lovely indeed. But even their great beauty cannot match that of my young wife. For her hair is the colour of the brightest summer sun upon the brightest summer day. Her skin is as soft as duck down and as white as milk. And her lips are redder than the reddest rose and she smells just as sweet. But there's a problem with my wife and the problem is this. She cannot talk. And I wish that she could talk for I feel certain if she could speak, her voice it would match the birds singing in the trees or the angels singing to the glory of God in heaven above. That's why I'm so sad this night. Having heard the merchant's words, the strange stranger began to laugh. He said, is that your problem, my friend? Why, that's no problem at all. I can give you a spell which will give your wife a voice. He fumbled in his pouch and he pulled out a small bone, a bone about the size of the end of my finger. And the merchant looked at the bone. He thought perhaps it really was a real finger, but he thought it better not to ask. The strange stranger gave the bone to the merchant. He said, take that home, bind it with a lock of your own hair. And this is the important bit. Place it beneath your sleeping wife's tongue for one hour before midnight till exactly one hour after midnight. No more, no less. So desperate was the merchant to hear his young wife speak that he followed the strange stranger's instructions to the letter. And at one o'clock in the morning, he plucked the bone from beneath his sleeping wife's tongue. And then he tried to settle down to sleep. But that night, sleep would not find the merchant, for he was desperate to know if the bone had worked its wondrous spell to know if his wife she had a voice finer than the birds singing in the trees or the angels singing to the glory of God in heaven above and so he sat up in his bed he kissed his wife gently upon the cheek and he said Elizabeth Elizabeth rouse yourself and talk to me slowly young Elizabeth she began to awaken in a fair and fine fashion. Her eyelids, they fluttered gently in a fair and fine fashion. She stretched and she oh, yawned in a fair and fine fashion. She turned to her husband and she spoke. And remember my friends that this is the first time that that beautiful young woman had ever, ever spoken. She said, what do you think you're doing waking me at this time? You know I don't go up before the first cock cry in the morning. She chided. She scolded her husband until eventually he could bear it no longer. He rose early and he went to his place of business. But he did come back that evening, for he felt certain that his new wife, her tongue, they would come, give him time. But as the days turned into weeks, his fair and fine young wife, she developed a foul dis dispensation. That's not the word, is it? Foul something or other. A temper, let's just say. Her tongue, he'd never seen a tongue as busy as hers. It went blah, 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 all day long. Her tongue, it went blah, 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 all night long. He likened her tongue to a sharp knife. But every time she scolded him, it cut that poor man to the bone. Oh, how he wished he could sheath that knife. Oh, how he wished he could sharp his scolding wife. Now know this, in Tudor times, if she'd have been the wife of a poor man, they may have well ducked her in the river, the river went some in Norwich, to cool both temper and tongue. But because she was the wife of a rich man, they could not do such a thing. And so in desperation, the merchant went in search of the stranger. And when he found him drinking in a low alehouse, the merchant fell to his knees and said, please, please, I can bear it no longer. Please take back my scolding wife's voice. 
but the stranger shook his head and said he could not. He said, know this, rich merchant of Norwich, I am not really a man. I am a demon from hell. And like any demon from hell, I have the power to work many wondrous spells, including giving the gift of speech. But know this, rich merchant from Norwich, neither I, not even the devil himself, can shut a woman up once she has started. And there ends that tale. Now, I should say that story has got me in trouble occasionally. Yeah. But. <laughs> Why? <laughs> but you know what? The reason I chose it tonight was because you have to read between the lines. And that's because there's always, in historical terms, there's always a difference between the ideal and the reality of life. And the ideal, certainly in terms of women at that time, was that women should keep to half and home and know their place. But when you look at the reality of Tudor times, it's not like that at all. I was going through the court records of Norwich and there's all sorts of court records that prove that. A lovely one comes to mind. The, uh, the mayor's court, their watch, the constables of the time were sent to serve a warrant upon a man called Henry Simmons. He'd been up to no good. But when they appeared at Henry Simmons door and offered him the warrant, it was said that Simmons' wife did snatch the warrant from him. She did tear it up and she said, a turd in the mare's teeth, I thought he had more wit. In other <laughs> words, women really did speak their mind in Tudor times, but that doesn't often come across. Um, some people say that stories like this, there's a great, she's a great historian called Margaret Spufford, and she wrote a book, it's worth reading, called Small Books and Pleasant Histories, and it's all about the cheap print of this time. And she said, in actual fact, stories like the one I've just told you, it's not mocking women for nagging and scolding, it's mocking the pretensions of men who think that their women are going to be all meek and mild and go, ah, like this all the time. And she also says, because the reality was different, because there were women like Simmons' wife, in actual fact, stories like the one I've just told you, and there were numerous different versions of that tale I could have told, were there to serve as a, as a pressure relief, like a, a valve, if you will, just to, to get over the fact that some men were really worried about the fact that their wives weren't doing as they expected them to do. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? Indeed, it does, <laughs> So in other words, stories long ago, they reflect the ideas, the beliefs of the common sort, the likes of you long ago. And that's all I've got to say on that. Thank you very much. Brilliant, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Excellent, now, excellent, now I've, excellent. I've got a question, mm -hmm. um, not for you, but for everyone. I've got, been getting in uh, mm. text saying my voice is echoey. Has it stopped being echoey now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I've found out the problem. I balanced it, and I, I, I share this in case anyone else is um, to get the computer to the right level. I balanced it on a box, uh, and of course, the box had, had acted like an echo chamber, like it is now. Oh dear. Well, maybe I should lean back a bit. I don't know. I put. I now put a cushion between the thing and the box. But, uh, but anyway, uh, I, I tried different. Can I machines. interrupt your Zoom for a second? Pardon? Can I interrupt? For, can I just interrupt for a second? Trudy, this is Fiona. Hi. Very good. Yeah, they're old friends. <laughs> <laughs> Thank a, you. Sorry, a, a, I'll shut up we're now. We're talking across the Atlantic here. <laughs> right can i uh, this, that, that was that was great i mean that's one of the things about this magazine is that we've had this before where people have, that haven't seen each other for years because there's been oceans between can say hello to uh. each other um i hoped at this point to but i mean just for chronology um to bringing uh vanessa wolf next but she is having enormous problems with an internet maybe That'll be sorted out by the end of the program. So I want to move forward to another continent and another time. I'd like to move to uh, the Great Depression. And uh, after this, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll bring in Trudy um, with uh, 
with actually not store not it's it's a historical story but it's a co contemporary one uh and it's probably going to be more about vegetation than human than human beings uh, but uh they but for the moment norman you promised me a tale of the great depression have you missed uh, me sure. are you going to do a tale of, of something up no great i'm looking forward to it right well i'm leading up to a story and the um the story is one of the few stories my father told me and i title it his story the out of the darkness sweetness and uh, the darkness i refer to is many stories from the depression were not told people it was such a traumatic event right across canada and other places that people didn't want to talk about it and this writer Dave, um, barry broadfoot went to the history books and he found a paragraph here a couple lines there and he realized there this event that affected so many people in so many different ways nobody had written it down the the scholars said uh, well uh, economically it was bad and then world war ii started well other things happened too so what he did what barry did is he went across canada and uh he sometimes he hitchhiked sometimes he did this and he took a tape recorder and a notebook and he said very simply, tell me a story about what it was like back in the 30s. And he got hundreds, thousands of stories, some pretty incredible ones. Because there was a big change. In 1928, life was generally good, hard. Money was moving around and people had jobs. But then the depression came and everything stopped. As one man said, there was no money moving. Nobody had a job. It was 10 lost years. And that gave him the title of his book, 10 Lost Years. And what he did was collect the stories, the stories of the regular people, the, the history that Dave, you know, you talk about that uh, the historians have basically walked away from. He collected those stories. And I want to give you a couple of them. For instance, I said, money stopped moving. Well, People still have to eat. They still have to work. One man worked on a prairie farm for an entire year working in the fields. And his pay was going to be an accordion. He figured that he'd be able to pawn it it's somewhere in the city. And he, the whole year went by. And sometimes on a Saturday, they'd pull out that accordion. They would play it. There would be good times. And then they would put it away and on the shelf. But he's always thinking about that. It would be his at the end of the year. And that the day he, he was to leave and take the uh, musical instrument with him, he saw the looks on the family, faces of the family. They did not take their eyes as he was carrying that accordion out of the house. For then he stopped and he realized this family had nothing. They could pay him no money. They could give him food, but that was it. And he was taking the one thing in their lives that was a spark of joy. And so he just left it by the door. And as he said, for a year of work, I had nothing. And he walked to the road and stuck out his thumb. Life was hard. But bartering did still work. And one family talked about, well, our doctor, we had no money to pay him. So our first child, I think we paid for her with pork chops and carrots. Um, the second one was eggs and pickles. And so it went. And that's how people made their living. But eventually, money still started moving around. But life was still hard. And this is the last two little stories I will tell, and then I'll tell my father's story. Money was still moving. And there was this man who found a job, a temporary job. I don't have the notes for which job it was here in Toronto. But he worked hard for a couple weeks, and he was paid with a $5 bill. Sometimes that would be a pay for an entire month. And here he had $5 spending money. 
something that he had not seen for years. And he was so proud of it that he let his little five-year-old daughter carry it. And then she lost it. She came back from the store saying, Daddy, I lost the money. I didn't buy what you asked me to buy. And the father looked at his little daughter and despair and anger and bitterness and he stood there and he backhanded her and she fell to the ground and then realizing what he had done he collapsed he sat on the ground sobs racked his body and the little daughter she got up she walked over to her father and she put her arms around him as he sobbed Times were hard. But sometimes luck came the way. Who knows, maybe it was that same $5 bill. But another story, money came blowing down the street and the man found it. And he picked it up. And he went back to his family. Now, they needed shoes. They needed clothes. They needed food. But more than anything else, they needed joy. Like the music from the accordion. And so instead, he, um, he decided to take his children, I think there was three of them, and his wife, and they went to the Canadian National Exhibition. Things were cheap, so a nickel could get a hot dog. And a nickel could buy a couple rides on the uh, Ferris wheel and all of the other games. And then they played all the games. They ate cotton candy. They celebrated. And when it was all done... I think they had a dollar left. And with that, well, they bought the thing, a few things that they needed. And that reminds me of the story of Erasmus. He said, when I find a little money, um, I buy books. And if there's anything left over, I'll buy a little bit of food. <laughs> but, you know, so there, the book, 10 Lost Years, is about two inches of stories all like this. And it was really hard to choose which ones from it and to lead up to my father's story. Dad never told us about, told me about his childhood. And I was on the phone one day and uh, I, I don't know what sparked it, but he told me this story about something that happened in, when he was living on a farm north of Toronto. And this is the best way, I think, to retell it. It's a story of the Depression, and in some way, it's a story of hope and how stories cannot be buried. So I was on the phone with my father, and Dad says, and uh, something sparked this story. And here I am to give it to you. When he was a young lad, 12 or 14 years old, living on a farm north of Toronto near a small uh, hamlet called Schomburg, life was hard as it was for everybody. But the one thing a, a farm can do is provide food. And so they had the vegetable garden like everybody else, and they, uh, they got by. But what they didn't have were some of the luxuries of life. For instance, honey. Honey was a, a, a real expense and not something to waste money on. So they went without. Now, one November, my father's father, my grandfather, called Clarence. That was his name. Clarence were going upstairs into the room. I mean, they knew the room. The room was the one that had been locked up. Nobody was to go in there. And you'll find out why in a moment. And so I imagine them going up the stairs. It's a cold November uh, day. The house is cold because heating wood and coal are, are expensive. And I can imagine the creaking sounds of those old stairs going up. And they came to the hallway and they went to the door that had been shut until this day. 
The door was opened, it creaks as it opens, and they walk across the floor. And as soon as they open that door, a smell fills the air. And my grandfather takes that crowbar and he drives it down into the floor and he begins to rip up the floorboards, one after the other. Screeching sounds, the boards pull out of the joists as if he was looking for something. And what's he looking for? And what he found was honeycomb. Between the joists, the bees having found a hole through the brick wall and into the house between the joists and had built themselves a hive. And all through that summer, they had been bringing the harvest of the forest and the flowers and the farm, farm fields, buckwheat, dandelion, you name it. And they filled that floor with honeycomb, hundreds of pounds of honeycomb. And this was the time to harvest it because now the bees were dormant and sleeping. It was too cold for them to buzz around and huh, cause a little bit of damage. And so with knives and buckets, and they filled the buckets and plates and pails, and they took them down to the kitchen. And my father told me that they covered every surface with every vessel they had in the house with honey, honeycomb. And when they were done and all of it was out, put the floorboards back into place. And my father, when he finished this story, he said with the words, we shared it. We shared all of it. People came from all around and they, nobody went away without a little bit of honeycomb. And that's pretty well the end of my wee story. In a way, that's what, for me, out of the darkness of the depression, Barry Broadfoot brought stories. My father brought a memory. And now I understand, understood why he always loved honeycomb at his meals. And that's my story. Thank you, Norman. And that's a real flavor of the time. I, my, my father, when he was 15, 16, 17 years old, was over on the other coast of mm. Canada, was in, uh, um, on Vancouver Island through, through the depression. And his, and the story that st he told me lots of stories because people tell their chil their children stories of that mm -hmm. time in their life. But the one that sticks in my mind was that he was working on a farm with his father and uh, they, uh, whether it was a bossy or, or a bunkhouse or, or whether they were at the farmer's table, but he had flu and uh, that, uh, and they served him up his supper and he couldn't eat it it's because he was feeling so ill, he couldn't eat it. So they served it up again, the same, the, the, what he'd left on his plate, they served him up cold the next morning for breakfast. And that was just one step too far. And he walked off the farm. And he's walking down the road and he, hitch, he was hitchhiking and a Model T Ford came along and picked him up. And the guy asked him where he was working and he told him, he said, Ah, it's a good job you weren't working on the with the horses on the, on that farm. That team has killed six men already. And he said I was. And I just, you know, it's just that that whole, you know, the, where horses are worth more than human life during that period. Uh, it just stuck in my mind. Um, but he, unfortunately, he wouldn't tell me about the run rumming, you know, from down down, ah. down, the, down the coast. They, they 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 ran rum down from Canada during the prohibition. But he he just mentioned it, and uh, he yeah. was, uh, the the talking about rum runners. Um, I've forgotten about the story from the Ottawa Valley. There's a man named John, and he had a boat that we he called the Ghost, and the reason for it was that it was the uh, a rich man uh, boat had had gone to the bottom, but it was still in good shape. So he resurrected it, 
and he was able to get a, an outboard motor for it. And at that time, the average uh, horsepower of the average police boat was about three horsepower and five if they could needed a good fast boat. John's Ghost had a 150 horsepower outboard engine. Nobody could catch him. And he well, moved I, a lot of rum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, people, people, the, people actually forget about the running down by boat uh, during that period uh, from Canada down to the state. Thank you, Norman. You've been brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. And, I'm, and, and anyone who if we want to see more of Norman, uh, next uh, next Sunday, uh, live at the same time at six o'clock. Norman will be live, so uh, so so come and see him then. But I'm going on to my last. Uh, Vanessa doesn't seem to have managed to get back to us, uh, so which is a shame. But there will undoubtedly be other opportunities to see Vanessa. Keep your eyes open. But right now. I'm going down to East Texas, uh, and I'm going down to a little town called Orange, and I'm going to the edge there, and I'm going down Burton uh, Street or Burton Road or, uh, or South Burton. I, uh, South Burton, I think. I, am I right, South Burton? Uh, my memory cell is going. Yeah, uh, and, uh, I'm going down there, and I'm, I'm going to step off, to step, step out the, the pickup truck that I borrowed. And, uh, and I'm going into I'm going into a yard, and uh, and and in that in that yard will be a rose tree, and, uh, and and there'll probably be some animals running around, and maybe a few grown-up children, and uh, and possibly my next teller. And uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, could you please give your a big round of applause to Trudy Terry? Hey. Well, I'm sorry, hey, Becky. I'm not out. Hey, I'm not outside because the skeeters are too bad, and I'm in my bedroom, which is a total mess, just like John's house. And this, <laughs> but this is the only room I can keep the dog in, so um, she won't uh, be making racket. Anyhow, uh, what I wanted to tell y'all is, I know there are a lot of people that work with genealogy nowadays and they're busy tracing their ancestors. And they want to tell other people about all the things they found out, but it's boring. You know, when you get to the begats in the Bible and how you just kind of phase out and, and you're thinking about somebody else or the begats just kind of wear on you. Well, that's the same thing when we go into our family tree and we tell you know, who begat who and who and who. And so um, I found out um, years ago about my family. And my family, we talked about our family all the time because we're Southern. And um, we just do that. It's just ingrained in us. And um, my mother's grandmother came from... Missouri. She and her family walked from Missouri in the 1840s. They walked from Missouri to East Texas and they came to a little town that was no town there at the time, but they made a little town with the other people that walked with them. And uh, my grandmother's name was Sarah Connors. Now, she was a young girl when she walked from Missouri. And when she walked from Missouri, she brought with her a rose bush. And I would have liked to have shown y'all a piece of the rose bush, but there are no roses on it right now. Although it blooms year round, from January all the way to December, it blooms. And it's a little flower about this big around. And the petals fall off as soon as you pick it. But it's a little pink flower, and it makes rose hips. And it's a beautiful little flower. It smells wonderful. And my grandmother walked, my, my great-grandmother walked all the way from Missouri, which it takes from my house to my friend's house in Missouri, it took eight hours driving 75 miles an hour 
and only stopping twice to pee. And that's as fast as I could make it. But it took them about six weeks, and that was walking pretty fast. Now, I trace my family back. My daughter went through the matriarchal line, and she discovered that they came. Originally, they started out in uh, North Carolina, which is on the eastern seaboard. And I'm sure that they walked from there to the next place they stopped. And they were all subsistence farmers. They raised what they ate. And if they sold anything, they could buy shoes, but mostly they made their shoes. And they made their houses. They built everything they owned. And I saw my great-grandmother's house. Um, And it was a dog trot cabin. And a, a dog trot cabin has rooms on two sides and an open walkway. And that's the dog trot. And so they lived, and my my great-grandmother married a man who had three children, three boys, and then she had 16 children that she gave birth to. And my grandmother was the eighth child, the eighth daughter. And so um, my mother was the eighth daughter. But I'm the first daughter, and she stopped it too, so that was all there was. Although my my youngest daughter likes to think if only she'd been an eighth daughter, the eighth daughter of an eighth daughter of an eighth daughter. But you see, genealogy can get you into trouble. Anyhow, all of those things happened. <clears throat> my mother didn't have a, a rose bush from my grandmother, but my uncle T did. He's my mother's oldest brother, and his name was John Thomas Morse. And when I, my husband and I built our house, the one that John Rowe is telling you about, my uncle John Thomas brought me a piece of my great grandmother's rose bush and he planted it in my yard. And now it's about six feet tall, almost it's as tall as I am, a little taller, and it makes rose hips. And if you don't know know what a rose hip is, it makes like a little bulb in in the growth, and you can eat them. And they're full of vitamin C. So if you ever get sick, just take a bite of that. And it amazes me that what started out in the 1700s, walking from North Carolina to Missouri to Texas, is growing in my yard. And it's a real thing, and it's a real piece of my living history. And when you find these kinds of stories in your family, You need to tell them because I told my younger daughter the story of the rose bush and how our granny walked it all the way from Missouri to Texas and it had started out life in North Carolina. Maybe they brought it from wherever they came from. They might have brought it from England. I don't know. But I do know that I have a piece of it growing in my yard. And when I I took her out and I was telling her about it, just, you know, like you ramble along talking to your kids, she got all excited. And she started looking in the matriarchal line because my, my father's family, those people took good notes and records and they wrote down every kid that was ever born and we have a bible that has it all in there ever whoever they married every one of them although um one of them is just the wife was named elizabeth and that's all we know about her and i hope she wasn't like the elizabeth that was the scold and the nag that dave tong told us about i hope she wasn't like that but she could have been 
because she's my ancestor and I can definitely be an ag. And my my husband was so good, he would have never called me that, but I have done it. And my daughter has gone all the way back, um, and I, I don't remember all of the, the here's and the there's and where they were and stuff, but those people walked. They might have had a covered wagon if they had enough money for a wagon and a horse, but most of the time, because my folks were, they were from the lower echelons of society, not the higher echelons of society, although we do have a few claims to that, but most of them weren't. We we really, we were the middle, lower middle class working people and um, subsistence farmers. And so those are the people who are my ancestors. And I'm proud of them. I'm proud that they survived. And they gave their children strange names. I have an aunt, Roxy I. Doomer, and I have another aunt uh, that died young, and her name was uh, Issaquina. And I have often thought about who in the world would name their child Issaquina. I just can't understand that, but uh, I thought she was lucky she died young. Anyhow, that's what I wanted to talk to you about, is if you have been collecting your names and your ancestry, put some stories to those, even if you have to make them up. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't make this one up. I really didn't. My rose bush came, I know, from Missouri, and it probably came from North Carolina because it was a luxury good, and they would have taken their luxury goods with them. And um, that's that's what I have to tell you is, you know, my mama had a platter and on her table when she was a, a little girl, and she told me all about it, and she told me the aunt that broke it. And she told me how it was broken and that my aunt hid it because she was so ashamed that she broke it. And this platter was had a picture on it, and it had the picture of a cow going down to the water. And my mother told me that was the most beautiful thing she had ever seen. And one time I was at a, a trade fair, not a trade fair, I was at a great huge garage sale in Missouri, this and a friend, and we went to Kansas to this great, big, enormous flea market thing. And I saw that platter. Now, I couldn't afford it, so I didn't bring it home to her, but I took a picture of it, and I did bring that home. And she was so delighted. Just to, She said, oh, that just, you know, that just brings, makes my heart. Stop for a minute because she saw it again and it made her happy. And she told me the story all over again. You save those stories and you tell them to your kids, and your kids will become interested in your family tree, especially if you've got some burglars or a horse thief or two. Now, we happen to have on some <laughs> of my sides of the family, we happen to have some moonshine makers. And uh, it tickled me when I heard about y'all's moonshine shifting. Uh, but y'all were bringing down good liquor from Canada. And what uh, my folks were making was bad liquor. So anyhow, that's all I have to tell you today. And I really appreciate that my dog, Bonnie, was quiet. And she has a really deep wolf, and it scares her when she wolfs it herself. So... I'll show y'all Bonnie's picture. Well, That's all I ever well. see of her is her back. So I love y'all, oh, and oh. I've had a great time. 
Lovely. So, thank um, you, Trudy. Thank you, Trudy. Well, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, you, did, you didn't take us down the Louisiana Strip. They're, they're a totally different set of stories. <laughs> yeah, they are. And we have some family from there, too. Now, no, I'll tell you all this. Yeah, they're the bad people. We'll, 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 no, we'll, talk, about the, we'll talk about the Louisiana Strip when, when we do bad people. <laughs> No, they were not bad people. Oh, they sorry, were sorry. people who were trying to make a living, and they were doing the best they could. And when you're doing the best you can, that's all you can do. All right, now, I second I'm going to tell you all goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, Trudy, you were fantastic. fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Got that echo back. <laughs> right, I only need one of me. Right. Okay. Now, Paul. Now, just oh. just give us a little perspective on that, on how you see, you know, I mean, we've covered all kinds of sort of, they're, they're people stories, aren't they, you know? It's yeah, like, I'm just sitting here listening to people's stories, you know, as a, a storyteller who didn't come from a tradition of storytellers, when I started my career going off to, on a course, I felt that a bit like a fraud. I didn't have stories in my blood. And then over the years, I began to realize, of course, that everybody's got stories. But more importantly, um, that actually every story you hear and you begin to tell becomes your story. You, it becomes part of your blood um, and you tell it in such a way as if you were there. Um, and I'm gonna to start tomorrow night with a true story. Um, for a short time, I supplemented my story telling income by gardening, which I adore, still love it. And I was standing in this lady's garden and she said, I'm gonna tell you a story about me. It's about a three minutes <laughs> and it will blow, well, it blew my head off, I, I have to say. And I will tell that tomorrow evening just to start off, to make a link with this evening. Um, and I think, you know, in these times, which are so strange, one of the great positives is I'm sitting here and I'm talking to people from all over the world. And that's, that's amazing because uh, we, you know, I have a yurt, I travel around with my yurt and it gets full and, you, and that essence that we get when we have a small space the energy that you get from your audience in a small space is extraordinary. Uh, and in a way, I'm, I'm going to use the small space of all these little screens tomorrow night uh, and squash you in my yurt. <laughs> so I know which story I'm going to start with. I haven't got a clue after that, which is the way I quite like it. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. But so great. That's that's my link for tomorrow night. I'm going to tell you a peach of a three minute story. That's true. OK, well, fantastic. It's been a great night. I'm looking for I'm lo I'm looking forward to tomorrow night. Thank you, Norman. Dave. Trudy, if you're still there. Still there, Trudy. Uh, I hope I missed out. Uh, you. Pardon? You. No, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's me. Okay. And, and remember, all those tellers have got a little hat. You can drop, you just find it, drop, drop serpents in. They're trying to, uh, they're, 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 they're trying to survive these hard times. And, uh, you know. John, can I ask uh, one question, John? Yeah. Do you, have you got your glasses back? Is that what I can see? No, no, I've got half a got This, this <laughs> lens, ha this, this has a lens in. This one hasn't. <laughs> there's, a, so, there's a, so, uh, but I, I'm using the lens so I can at least read the names and, you know, and, and that, it's, it's, not, it's not so much for fun when you're all a blur. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, it's, it's kind of, yeah. Mm. And, and, uh, well, I'm, thank you all for coming. You've thank been you brilliant much. as always. Thanks, John. And yeah. I can't wait. I don't know what the subject is next week, but we'll we'll explore another theme. And uh, we've got such good stuff coming up.
just keep checking the program. I recommend checking it at about halfway through the day. So, you know, because we never know what, to, because we're dealing with technical things. Um, yeah. We, yeah. we never know what's coming in. Uh, we, we, we have a plan, but like all plans, you know, it's, it's like having the whole of your, uh, everyone you've got at, at the festival coming in my vehicles, which break down. Yeah. Uh, so there's a, we're all learning about, about this technical stuff. So, uh, so just, just check, just check us out every day. Uh, uh, but whatever it is, it's going to be good, especially tomorrow night. Right. right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks John. Thanks, John. Thanks, John.